So as we enter into this, this time of focusing on um, the name of the Lord, the name of Jesus, the name of the Lord, um, and um, calling on the name of the Lord, uh, the first question on your sermon supplement says, when you pray to God, do you add in the name of Jesus at the end of your prayer? And if yes, why do you do it? Or what that's about? And if you don't, but you've heard, you've certainly heard other people do it, what is your, your understanding, your sense of what it's about for them, why they do it? So could we just take one minute, turn to one or two people near you? Do you end your prayer with this? Now, in my case, I often do, probably usually do, but not all the time. So it's a continuum. Um, uh, but when you do, if you do, what's that about? And what have you observed with other people when they do it? All right? Let's talk, share a bit. All right. I know a minute's not very long, but I'm sure you learned you learned a few things just in that in that short amount of time. So I invite you to take a nice easy breath or two. And hear the reading from Acts in which Peter heals a man lame from birth in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, is then brought before the religious leaders and asked to defend himself. And so I'm reading from Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 5. The next day, the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, all and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners, that's Peter and John, stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed, done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. This is the word of God for all God's people. Thanks be to God. When I looked over the four possible scriptures in, for today in the lectionary, what grabbed my attention was this piece about um, power in the name of the Lord. Now, the Acts thing doesn't say power, but that's what it's talking about, right? Healing power. Grabbed my attention and wouldn't let go, so if I maybe wanted to preach on John and the shepherd, that was not what was coming up. It was, P it was Acts and Peter's healing. So when Peter, after healing in the name of Jesus, stands before this kind of informal tribunal, he once again repeats that the name of Jesus 
is the reason that this man, lame from birth, is now able to stand, walk, even run. In addition to this story in Acts, we have the familiar story, a piece of it that Connie read about David and Goliath, and we also have Psalm 113, in which the, uh, the Lord's name is praised. So my question to you is, do you think of the name of God or Jesus having power? Now the answer is probably yes, but if you don't think of it very often, which most of us don't, I'm not calling for an amen, but we know that, right? You have to reflect on it a little bit, possibly, to say what is your sense of power around it. Now, uh, the New Testament is focusing here on Jesus, but I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, calling, calling on the name of God and calling on the name of Jesus. Because calling on the name of the Lord, whether you are in a Christian context focusing on Jesus or you are in a Jewish context focusing on, as David did, the Lord of hosts, calling on the name of the Lord is a big thing in Judaism and Christianity and in both Testaments, old and new. Sometimes calling on the name of the Lord, we sometimes use the word invoking the presence of God, which I often do in the opening to the Spirit at the beginning. Sometimes it has to do with claiming a space for worship, gathering people together, or sanctifying a space, and that word means making it holy. So when we do that here on Sunday morning, we say there's something different going on here on Sunday morning than goes on during the week when we just happen to be walking through the sanctuary for one reason or another. Something different, and it has to do with this calling on the name of the Lord. Sometimes it has to do with violence and victory, as it did in the case of David and Goliath in that story. Sometimes it has to do with gratitude and praise, as it does in Psalm 113. Sometimes it has to do with healings, more or less dramatic, as it does in the Acts scripture. Calling on the name of the Lord, brothers and sisters, is a big thing in our tradition. But what came up in me as I was reflecting on this is that I've never preached on this topic, and I would bet it's a topic that many of you here have never heard a sermon on either. So let's take just a brief look at it today, get some sense of what this is about. Let's talk about the power of the name, God, Jesus. Now, this whole idea of the authority of a name is not just in religion. Think of how many movies you've seen where a, a man is riding, a warrior is riding hard on a horse. He comes up to the, the door of a castle, he knocks on it. And so, what does he say? Open in the name of the king or whoever. That's, that's the kind of secular parallel to one aspect of what we're talking about. So calling on God's name, as Peter does, as David does, Peter for Jesus, David for the Lord of hosts, has to do with authority and power, an authority that is beyond what we ourselves can do on our own. Judaism and Christianity both claim that calling on the name of the Lord connects us somehow with what we call the transcendent aspect of God. And I wrote a little piece about it at the bottom of your sermon sup, so I'm not going to say all of that. But the transcendent aspect of God is the aspect that is ultimately beyond our understanding. It is the big God, the creator of the universe that is ultimate mystery and in somehow beyond the scope of the universe. The imminent aspect of God, I-M-M-A aspect of God, is the presence of, the, of God within creation, and also in Christians, we talk about that indwelling presence of the Spirit, whether we think of that sometimes as Jesus or we think of it other times as Holy Spirit. That's an aspect of the imminent aspect of God. When God calls Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, what does, what does Moses ask God for? What does he say? Who are you? Tell me your name. Why does he ask that? He says, if, if I don't have a name to give when I go to the Israelites to tell them I am going to do this incredible thing, they're going to say, ah, in colloquial language, ah, forget it. 
So God does respond to his question. Moses wants authority. He wants authority. He wants power. He needs that name. And how does God respond? God says in in Exodus chapter 3, I am who I am. That's how it's most often translated from the Hebrew. It is also sometimes translated, I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. Moses asks God for a name, and what does he get? Kind of a verb, right? It's kind of a verb. It's, It's a sentence, really. But it sure isn't just a noun. Can I have an amen? It is not just a noun. When you ask someone for their name, do you expect a verb? You expect a noun. That's how we understand names. So God gives Moses an answer. But he gives Moses an answer that is in itself perplexing and mysterious that kind of throws us into this non-rational realm of things. God tells Moses and tells us that God's not a noun or even a being, probably, as we think of a being. God is being itself, but not a a being. Confusing? The transcendent God can be more than a bit confusing. Moses may not like God's answer, but that's the name he uses when he goes to the Israelites. That's the name he claims and draws power on. That's the name he calls on to become the leader of the Israelites and to lead them out of Egypt. So what about you and me today here in Brentwood? Now, we pray for healings, and if we had an actual healing ministry here, we would be really calling on that name of God in Jesus even more than we do, and in a different way. But we do pray for healings, even though we're not performing the kind of healing that Peter is recorded to do here. We aren't doing the dramatic things that David or Moses um, are, are, are recorded to do or told to do, we're told in Scripture. But how do we call on the name of the Lord? Well, one example is from today's anthem. Now, most of you, how many of you have heard the, the, the spiritual that we were singing? Do, 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 do. I won't ask you to sing, but it was, close. it was a close call there. Okay. So the, the words start, as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? What's the next line? Good Lord, show me the way. Brothers and sisters, in that nice little anthem, that's a moment of calling on the Lord. It happens in all kinds of ways that we will notice if we attend to it more closely. In that case, good Lord, show me the way is a, is a calling on the Lord for direction, for understanding, maybe for courage as well. If you listen to others and yourself this week, you may find there's more calling on the Lord than you'd realize going on. And what's usually the first thing to come out of people's mouths when they are shocked by news of tragedy? And I don't care if they're Christians, Jews, Muslims, or atheists. You see it on the media all the time. What is very often the first thing if, even if you can't hear it, you see their mouths make the words. When they first hear of a tragedy, oh my God. I suggest to you that's a call, kind of calling on the Lord that's in our DNA. Not even necessarily just related to, uh, focused on a spiritual tradition. So let's come back to prayer for a minute. At the very beginning when you were sharing with one another, um, your experiences around praying in the name of Jesus. The Christian tradition of praying in the name of Jesus arises out of a number of sources, but one of the primary ones is in John's Gospel, especially chapter 16, when Jesus tells his followers that if they pray in his name, their prayers will be heard. If they ask for anything in Jesus' name, God will give it to them in John 16, verse 23. Well, this is a concept of Jesus being a sort of intercessor for us. You know what that means, kind of? 
praying for us. Intercessor is a much bigger word in Roman Catholicism than it is in Methodism, but it, is a, it does have a place in our, in our Christian tradition. So praying in Jesus' name gives us a sort of connection with God, a sort of access, we might say. Now, of course, not all our prayers are asking for something, I hope, right? We also pray out of gratitude and thanksgiving. The psalm that Connie read is praying out of gratitude and thanksgiving and celebration of God and the name of God. We pray out of joy and amazement. Can I have an amen on that one? We pray blessing the name of the Lord also at times. So let me suggest what may be going on um, at least a part of what's going on when we close our prayers within the name of Jesus. At least this is a part of what's going on with me and what I've observed a bit with others. And I didn't realize it until I reflected on it, on this power in the name stuff this week. For me, praying in Jesus' name, and it's usually at the end of a prayer, reminds me that God is love. I didn't really know that until I thought about it a bit this week, because the word love's not used. The God on whose name we call is huge. It is huge. The God on whose name we call is a transcendent God, usually, not always. Praying in Jesus' name reminds me that God is also personal and is on our side. We are learning here 2,000 years after Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth still about the power that is found in love. Praying in Jesus' name reminds me that I am in a deeply personal relationship with God through following Jesus. Now, I said reminds me. I, do not, I am not saying that you cannot have a personal relationship with the Holy One unless you pray in the name of Jesus. Please hear that. But if you do pray in the name of Jesus as a follower of him, you have a certain kind of specific personal relationship. It's a part of what comes with being a Christian. But we tend to forget um, that God cares for us. God cares for us. That's one of the things Jesus was trying to teach when he walked among us, right? God cares for us. It's not just we have to go through Jesus to have God care about us. But Jesus helps us to see God's care because Jesus for Christians is the primary face of God that we see. That's the important piece, I think. So when I say occasionally in prayer or other times or in benediction, God in Jesus Christ, that's what I'm talking about. That the God that is experienced through in, in Christianity is very often God in Jesus Christ. That face is what we see. That part of God, this huge mystery, has to do with Jesus. When I pray a close a prayer in Jesus' name, it also reminds me that my prayer and this God connection, that's also a Jesus connection, is similar to millions and millions of other children of God who pray in Jesus' name. That sense, it's not just me at that moment. I have some sense of connection. I don't usually think about it, but when I reflected on it, I realized that was the case. It ends my prayer with a sense of peace and confidence. Not confidence that God is going to do just what I asked, but confidence that I am heard and received. That is a kind of power, of course, but it's a very gentle but still profound power. So this week as you pray, I invite you to attend a bit to how your prayer, if you end it or if you call on the name of Jesus and mention it in some way, how it strengthens, deepens, or nurtures your God connection, because that's a part of what it is, and possibly your connection with other Christians around the world. And I end with this. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.